Assalamualaikum. So, Prof. Isa, uh, should we um, wait a few minutes or do we start? I think. Is our speaker is here? Yes, sure. Why not? We, we, we can start now, I think. Okay. Then the rest will follow later. Yeah. InshaAllah. So, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I hope my voice is clear, inshaAllah. So, uh, we will start uh, today's sharing session with Ummu Kitab Al-Fatiha. So... Alhamdulillah, um, insyaAllah today we will be having a sharing session with, uh, uh, with all of you here. So despite the brightness of my background, it's actually a very bleak and wet day in Kuantan today. Uh, but I hope that uh, even with the bad weather, we can uh, make uh, some uh, <laughs> cheerful and informative sharing today. So, inshallah, a few housekeeping announcements before uh, we proceed. So, uh, as usual, I would like everybody to uh, mute their microphones uh, if they are not talking. And also, uh, the attendance link will be provided in the chat. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, good morning to our uh, beloved uh, Deputy Director of Professional Development, Associate, Associate Professor Dr. Izawati Tukiman, our esteemed speakers, uh, professors, Associate Professors, academicians and fellow colleagues. Um, so today we will be having a sharing uh, session with the award winners of Anugra Academic Negara, which is organized by the Center of Professional Development, CPD, IIUM. So my name is Hidayatu Razia Ismawi, and I'm from the Kulia of Medicine, and I will be the moderator for today's session. So it's a pleasure to have with us again uh, this morning morning our so we are welcoming back two esteemed speakers who are Anugrah Academic Negara recipients uh, in 2019 who will share their invaluable experience with us so today we have two speakers lined up our first speaker uh, Dr Shariza Mat Sharif is from uh, University Malaysia Terengganu our neighbors uh, well my neighbor in in Kuantan uh, UMT and uh, who is the recipient of anugerah pengajaran kelompok sains gunaan and our second speaker a bit later uh, this morning is associate professor Dr Un Chir In from University Science Malaysia USM so it's a East Coast East Coast show this uh, this morning. Eh? So uh, she is the recipient of Anugrah Ahli Academic Harapan. So for those of us who are unaware, um, the prestigious Anugrah Ac Academic Negara is the highest recognition which is given out by the government to scholars who have contributed to the field of teaching, knowledge discovery, scientific and creative publications, as well as the transfer and development of knowledge at both national and global uh, levels. So these are the rock stars of the academic world. Eh? Okay, so the award is intended to spur ideas, discoveries and innovations uh, to thrive in this dynamic educational ecosystem of our country. Uh, noted previous recipients include our own beloved Prof Ulung Tan Sri Dr Muhammad Kamal Hassan and our rector Prof Tan Sri uh, Zulkifli Abdul Razak, who received the Toko Academic Negara Awards previously. So, um, firstly, I would like to introduce everybody to our first speaker. Uh, Dr. Shariza Mat Sharif is uh, a lecturer in the field of fish genetics at the Faculty of Fisheries and Food Sciences in University of Malaysia, Terengganu. So he's currently also the Director for Innovation and Talent Development Center in UNT. And his uh, research interests, which is uh, something very uh, alien to me, <laughs> is the genetic improvement of aquaculture species through breeding and molecular approaches. 
Okay. So uh, in teaching and learning, his focus is on the application of simulation-based learning and alternative assessment in fisheries and aquaculture, uh, where he has developed several teaching kits based on simulation-based learning. And one of the teaching kits is called Fish Breed Pro. Uh, which has won first place in the anugerah pemikiran dan reka bentuk semula pendidikan tinggi Malaysia in 2017. Uh, so as I mentioned before, he was the recipient for the 13th anugerah negara, uh, academic negara for teaching category in applied sciences in 2019. So um, I'm sure that his uh, extensive biography has hooked you. Uh, so now he will reel you in See, I'm making fishing puns. Eh? So he will reel you in with his uh, sharing session today. So I will hand over the pond to Dr. Shareza uh, to let us uh, teach us how to uh, swim the course of academic excellence. Dr. Shareza. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hidayat uh, for the introduction. And uh, again, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum and a very good morning uh, to all of you, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Izati, to all the uh, participants, professors, Associate Professors, doctors, ladies, and uh, gentlemen. Uh, first and foremost, uh, it's been a great honor for me eh, uh, to be invited again to share uh, some of the experience. Uh, related to this uh, AAN uh, to IIUM. I think this uh, is uh, coming to the, the third time. Uh, the first one was, uh, was in 2019, where I was invited to present to a, a group of uh, academicians. Uh, that one was face-to-face. -face. And then after that, it was uh, online. So, Sorry for the delay. Uh, I have some uh, little bit glitch with my laptop, so uh, managed to to uh, join the uh, Zoom. Okay. I hope everybody can see the, the slide and uh, can uh, hear me well. Uh, currently, it's uh, the same as in uh, IIUM. It's raining heavily here this morning in uh, UMT. <clears throat> so, um, without uh, further delay, uh, let me start off this uh, sharing uh, regarding uh, the uh, AAM. And uh, I put here the journey. Uh, of an educator. So uh, again, uh, just to uh, inform you, uh, as what has been mentioned by, by Dr. Hidayati, um, I'm a lecturer at the Faculty of Fishing and Food Science. And uh, here I would like just to uh, show uh, my uh, contact number so that uh, I welcome anybody if there is any uh, further inquiry or any further deliberation and discussion, feel free to contact me. Uh, I am uh, very glad to be able to assist yeah, in anything related to this uh, the academic uh, part. So what I will share today within this uh, one hour, 15 minutes, uh, I will break down into three parts. Okay, I will explain a bit about AAN, the teaching category. Okay. Uh, the second, I would like to highlight what I call as in pursuit to become uh, a great educator. Uh, what I mean by a great educator is not the uh, destination, but the process and the journey to attain the best 
of yourself. Okay. And uh, what I mean by the best of yourself, and it is not a destination because uh, the best is not static. Uh, through time, through development of things, the best will keep on changing. So the, the connotation that I would like to highlight is not the end or the, the destination, but the journey of uh, keeping on improving so, so that you are able to be at your best at any present situation uh, or, or uh, time. And the third one is just the conclusion or the summary of all the things that uh, has been given. Well, I would like to start with uh, this uh, <clears throat> word. So there is no power nor might uh, except with Allah. We can uh, strive, uh, we can put a lot of effort, uh, we can do a lot of things, but at the end of the day, it's all in the power of Allah. And uh, I'm thank to Allah uh, for granting me this uh, award, which uh, uh, I've never uh, imagined of getting. Uh, the first time I heard about AAN was in 2015 when the panel came to UMT to explain about what AAN is all about. So I was there as an academician attending the, uh, the briefing. So only to understand and uh, never dream of getting it because the way they explain uh, is such that uh, the award is, uh, is very prestigious. But uh, with the power of Allah ended up in 2019, uh, I was one of the uh, recipients. Okay, so uh, to those who uh, didn't uh, have a clear thing in mind of what uh, AAN, as mentioned by Dr. Hidayah, uh, the one that I put here is the same as what she explains. So it's about the recognition uh, of an academician in certain aspects, uh, as has been mentioned. And uh, one thing that I would like to explain here through my experience is regarding the teaching category. So actually in AAM, there are altogether six uh, teaching category. One of them is the one that I received, that is applied science. The second one is pure science which was uh, previously in 2018 was received by uh, our pengarah, uh, bahagian uh, pengajian tinggi, uh, professor, Associate Professor Dr. Wan Zuhaimis, uh, and she was pure science, and also Prof. Fauzia, uh, she was the applied social science. And we have also, there are also other categories in uh, medical, in engineering, as well as in uh, arts and uh, science. So in actual fact, if uh, there are eligible candidates at any Anugrah Academic Negara, there should be about six winners. That means one winner for each category. So for those of you uh, who may browse through and notice that in 2019, only one recipient won the award. So not to get you confused, it is not that out of all, award only been given to one candidate, but there are six category and the panel will choose one recipient for each teaching category. So as I said, it should be about six, right? <clears throat> this uh, AAN for teaching is a bit different. So I'm just uh, reiterating what uh, the previous uh, panel were mentioning. You need to go through three rigorous process. So it's different from other categories. And once you receive the award, it is a lifetime. That means you cannot uh, enter or submit for another um, for this award again 
is different from award for publication or books where if you have received the award for the publication that you have published, let's say in 2022, and uh, you have another impactful publication next year, you are still eligible to submit that publication for consideration of the award. But for teaching category, once you receive it, that's it, and uh, you will not be able to apply for another time. But having said that, you need to go to three phases, okay? where you need to prepare your teaching portfolio. You submit some sort of your summary of your journey of uh, yourself as an educator in teaching and learning. If you have attained a certain marks for your teaching portfolio, they will evaluate your portfolio. If you have achieved a certain marks, then they will call you for mock teaching. And uh, this session will combine together with an interview. So you will be given 15 minutes to present your delivery in teaching and learning. And after that, you will be interviewed. So about 15 minutes mock teaching, 15 minutes uh, interview session. And after that, the panel will evaluate and decide uh, to determine whether you are eligible or not to receive the award. Okay, <clears throat> so these are the things. Uh, to know more, <clears throat> then you can uh, yeah, contact me, then I can explain further. Because uh, today, we only have about limited time to explain. So <clears throat> please be aware that AAN is not a teaching and learning innovation competition. This is what some of the academicians misunderstood. They thought that, okay, I've developed something, so now I can uh, apply for AAN. So if you want to apply for your innovation, then enter currently now what they call as ACRI, uh, which I will be sharing uh, with uh, all of you again this March. Uh, thank you very much, IAUM CPD, for inviting me to share with uh, other panels. So, AAN is not a teaching and learning co competition. So, if you have a lot of innovation in your journey in teaching and learning, doesn't mean that you are eligible to receive the award. So, AAN is about your journey to improve yourself in teaching and learning. So where you are and how do you climb the ladder to what you call as becoming a great educator. So it is about the journey that you move to improve yourself. So this picture also does not resemble the actual thing, but I'm just trying to highlight, give you some analogy that you are trying to improve let's say from zero, from where you are, to somewhere that you are very skillful and you are able to provide an impactful presence to improve student learning. Okay? So again, this is not the destination, but a connotation of forever trying to improve yourself, always trying to give your best. So AAN, covers several aspects. So it looks into your philosophy, what you believe. Okay. Then they wanted to know your teaching and learning experience. So AAN comprised you to explain your a minimum of 10 years teaching and learning experience. So for those of you who are still not uh, having the experience uh, within 10 years, keep on building your experience. Then once you attain more than 10 years and above, 
you are eligible to apply. So that is one of the criteria, yeah? a minimum of 10 years teaching and learning experience. <clears throat> so they wanted to know what are the courses that you teach, how do you deliver the subject, the topic, how do you assess your student, is there any innovation? That means they wanted to know whether are you just uh, teaching for the sake of teaching or you also try to improvise something to improve your teaching and learning to increase the effectiveness of the delivery. And what are the impact that you have given to students, to the uh, teaching and learning uh, area? And also they looked into, they wanted to know regarding your supervision, how many students that you have supervised, your undergraduate, your postgraduate, and uh, how do you manage them? And do you have any approach in uh, supervising them? And they also want to know about your continuous improvement. How do you improve your teaching and learning? Okay. <clears throat> now, apart from that, it is not just about the things that you do to the students, but they also wanted to know that the things that you have improvised, that you have delivered, are they being shared to people so that it gives benefit to others, uh, academicians, uh, teachers, and also society. So it can be in terms of uh, journals, or books, or module, uh, sharing in online platform, going to conferences or seminar, and are you a trainer for certain uh, teaching and learning courses? But all this knowledge sharing is not in terms of your research field, but in terms of teaching and learning. And also they wanted to know, since you are passionate about your teaching, how do you improve yourself? What are the training that you went or you got, you've been through in order to keep abreast, to be relevant to the current situation, the current policy. And finally, they also like to see your academic leadership. Okay? So where you are uh, uh, in your university and whether you are playing a role at the national uh, level or can be at the international level. So these are the elements that has been looked upon when you submit your teaching portfolio. So again, from here, you can see that it is not just merely about having an innovation in your teaching and learning. <clears throat> well, uh, as I'm going along, if you have any question, feel free to stop me or you can uh, ask me in the chat, then I'll be happy to reply. So again, as you all know, success uh, is no accident. Uh, it is pure hard work, uh, perseverance, and learning. Uh, but most of all, loving what you are doing or learning to do. Uh, that is the most important thing in anything that you do, be it in teaching and learning, research, or doing community services. So that's about it regarding. AAM. So the next one is, <clears throat> now how do you start your journey? Now in my case, I will just share a bit. The beginning to become what we call as a very passionate uh, educator or to become a great educator. Now we all know that as an academician, we need to do several task. We have to do teaching and supervision. You need to do research. You need to publish. You need to disseminate the knowledge and knowledge transfer. And also there's another aspect that we need to be academic leadership, where this is where you become the examiner, the committee member of your society. Uh, academic society or becoming panel 
for uh, research or teaching uh, activities. So as you can see here, teaching and supervision is one of the important aspects of our task as an academician. But if you look into the growth of competency, okay, let us look. The initial start of our journey, everybody when they start to become uh, an academician. Now I reflect back. When we start our journey to become a lecturer, if you notice that we have done and have quite an extensive experience in research. Most of us will have about five to seven years of training. So where does the training comes from? You have one year when you did your final year project. And then some of you may have one year doing your master's. And most of you may have two years. And then we continue with our PhD. It can take about three to four years. Okay. Now, what I'm trying to explain here is for those academicians who are not in the line of education. If you're in the line of education, that means your research itself is in teaching and learning. But for me, for example, in fisheries, so five to seven years of training prior to become a lecturer is on the research aspects in the field of expertise. But let us look into teaching. There is no experience when we start our journey as, an, as a lecturer. So at the start of the career, you don't have any experience. And what you do is based on prior experience with looking at what your lecturers teach you during your student days. So we need to understand that when we embark as an academician in order to teach, not only that you need to have the knowledge in the field of uh, your expertise, that is the content that you are going to deliver, but you need to have knowledge in teaching. So we must equip ourselves with the knowledge on how to deliver the content. So having the knowledge in the content that you are going to deliver is still not sufficient. So you need to have the knowledge on how to deliver. That is where the pedagogy, the learning theories, okay, the teaching methods comes in. So just to reflect back, my journey started in 1996. I started off as a tutor and then becoming a lecturer in 2006. So during this time, realizing that the knowledge in teaching and learning is so limited in myself. So I start to attend a lot of courses. Uh, at the end, I will share to you again my uh, teaching portfolio so participants can have a look uh, at what I've uh, been through. So a lot of uh, trainings that I have attended uh, to improve myself in the understanding about OBE. And uh, in 2012, uh, focusing on e-learning, okay, and way back in 2014, then university start to gather the pool of talents, and I was the one, one of the uh, academicians that are being uh, pulled into the group for teaching and learning leadership. So from there, university also sent me for some of the training in ACAP related to teaching leadership as well as some of the uh, teaching and learning uh, methodology. So what I'm trying to highlight here is equip yourself first with all the necessary knowledge. So again, uh, when I was trying to equip myself, it is not about uh, to prepare to get an award. And uh, this is what I'm trying to, to explain to all of you because I'm pretty sure that a lot of you have uh, attended talks 
by recipient. And most of them, they will say that uh, when I did this, I was never thinking of, a, of uh, getting an award. So in this time around, what I'm trying to explain to you is to show you what does it mean by doing things, not trying to get an award, but ended up getting an award. So this is what I'm trying to, to explain to you. So the focus is actually on your self-development, but at the end of the day, you ended up with something else. So learning a lot, trying to have a lot of knowledge is still not enough. Okay? So as in this picture, if you don't know how to use them, it will never be enough. So you can attend a lot of courses getting your what called CPD points, okay? uh, putting them inside your SKT. Every year you have attended a lot of course, but there's no meaning if you don't practice and apply. So the second thing is in order to pursue of becoming a great educator, we need to brush up our skills. So the only way to brush up is to apply whatever we learn. And uh, this is where throughout my journey, a lot of methods that have been tested. So uh, I wouldn't have time to explain what are the things. So in this one, I will just highlight uh, a few that I have uh, tried. So throughout the years, I've tried a lot of uh, apps, a lot of methods uh, to uh, teach the students, uh, to improve the student learning. And you must remember, going, attending a course and then trying to apply, don't expect that when you do, it will be perfect. So throughout your journey, your best teacher is your last mistake. Okay? To become an expert, okay, you need to understand that like uh, Yoda in Star Wars said, the master has failed more times than the beginner has ever tried. So you need to uh, apply, uh, getting feedback from the students, and then try to improve further. Okay. I uh, want to share to you one of my experiences where when I started to learn about OBE, uh, from uh, at that particular time, the trainer was uh, Associate Professor Dr. Jafar Jantan. Straight away, uh, at, that, at that particular time, the semester, in that semester, I was teaching a course. I applied it straight away. And then after one month, when he came again to give a talk, uh, I attended the course again. And that is the time I took the chance to discuss with him whether I'm doing it the right way or not. So that is what we call the, the urge and the, the, the passion of wanting to ensure that what you are trying to do is the correct way and you will try to deliver your best to the students. So the need for continuous improvement. So the focus that I'm trying to show here is the feeling of wanting to equip yourself with the correct knowledge, with the proper knowledge, and to sharpen your skills. So the continuous improvement that you do will improve your delivery to your students and it will also increase the effectiveness and the development of the student. So in order for me to apply, we don't just apply uh, what we call it just for the sake of uh, trying. So you must have some fundamental things about your approach. And in my case, my teaching philosophy resides on three elements. That is flexible, adaptive, and diversified. Okay? Now, my philosophy resides on these three elements because we need to understand that there is no one-size-fits-all approach. What we implement today that we see effective may not be as effective to the next batch or to the students in five years to come. 
and we need to realize that every individual has the potential to succeed and they learn in a different way. <clears throat> so understanding about this is what uh, makes me becoming uh, creative, uh, makes me wanting to learn more about the teaching technique so that I can prepare myself to deliver to any students that I meet in the class. So during teaching, I always ensure to explain to the student these five elements so that preparing the mental map, preparing the understanding of the reason why I'm doing it in a certain way. So one of the thing is preparing the students so that they are able to be self-dependent, they are able to be more collaborative, and they are able to be more uh, self-determined learners. So among them is, you need to understand um, by learning you will teach and by teaching you will learn. So a lot of my activities are in such a way that they need to interact, uh, they need to talk to each other, and they need to share what they understand to the others. Uh, again, tell me, I will forget, show me, I may remember, involve me, I will understand. So transformation from just giving a lecture throughout my early days, and now less giving lecture, but a lot of activities uh, are being given to them. So they learn through activities rather than listening to lectures. And uh, the challenge now is during the online, and uh, that is where we need to readjust again to ensure that the learning happens even though they are everywhere. And uh, we need to understand this. Some, some uh, there are a lot of, of uh, papers, journals that uh, disagree with this learning pyramid. Okay? In terms of the numbers, if you look into uh, this publication. But what I'm trying to put inside this learning pyramid is that no matter how a lot of people disagree with this learning pyramid in terms of the percentage, okay? but we cannot deny that students who just attended lectures will not be attained the skills compared to if they are able to learn by doing. They do more, they learn more. So we cannot deny the fact of that. So that is the thing that leads me to devise the delivery. So to ensure that they learn by doing. So your desire to improve will then lead to innovation. So you don't do innovation because you want to win awards. You don't do innovation uh, because you want to create an IP or publication, because you strive to ensure the effectiveness of your delivery, you will try to think along various ways that you want to adopt and see whether this method is effective and helps the student to learn. So, this is where I would like to highlight a few things uh, of my uh, innovation. So trying to improve the teaching and learning, I created this uh, kit called Fish Breed Pro. So this kit is a kit to train students on how to become a wedding planner. So learning to mix and match the, the pair to produce fish that has a better characteristic faster growth more beautiful fish okay but how does the kid came about it came from my interest to know what are other things that i can do to improve your learning so that is the thing that the desire to improve the teaching and learning makes you be more innovative and creative so 
I always ask the student to give feedback. What do they think about my teaching? Uh, what do they think that they uh, that I can do to improve the classroom? So this is where I started to obtain some ideas. So during this time, they asked to have a lot of lab work. And one of the students suggested to me to have teaching kids. So throughout the years, I've been teaching them through the conventional method, but then I started to understand that, okay, uh, they feel that they can learn more if they have some assistant using some other teaching uh, assist method. So in my uh, program, which uh, Dr. Hidayatul was uh, informing all of you, I'm a fish geneticist. So what I teach is how to breed to produce various coloration in fish. Okay? So all this coloration, if you happen to go to an aquarium shop, you will realize that a lot of colors, the fish has a lot of colors, but they, these colors are produced through proper matchmaking practices. And this is what I call as a wedding plan. So with all the risk and issues to train the students, that is where it makes me to think, what are the other alternatives that I can do to ensure that the learning happens and they are still able to acquire the skill? Now, you can see here <clears throat> the drive to improve the learning experience okay, is never ending. Uh, the initiative started in 2013 after I've got a feedback from the students. So <clears throat> it comes to the kit design, uh, the kit development, uh, class activity, uh, implementation in lab practices, and implementation in practical exam. So the kit, when I started to develop, at first the intention was to create a learning experience during the classroom, ended up having to modify the course to have a lab activity using the kit, and finally having the kit as an assessment tool. Yeah. So again, as I re reiterate, the pursuit of trying to improve the teaching that leads me to keep on improving. Uh, this is what I meant again to, to, to mention to all of you, doing things not for the award, but doing things with the focus to improve student learning. <clears throat> so in my case, as you can see here, um, I don't give uh, lectures, but what I give is a briefing to them what they need to do. So a lot of the things are being done by themselves and monitored by me and also uh, discussion being made uh, among them. Then they need to go through the process okay, using my kids uh, to learn all the steps. And this kit enables them to learn the whole process which actually will take about four to five years in the actual practice, and they are able to learn this within six weeks. So the impact of having this kit is it improves the student performance. It gives a whole dimension in the teaching and learning where you use the simulation-based learning. It actually simulates what is happening here uh, in the field, but now they are doing it in the classroom or in the lab, and it helps the faculty uh, to reduce the cost of the operation. So uh, this is why I said doing things with desire to improve the student, but again, you ended up with receiving other things. So this is what I meant as doing things, not for the award, but suddenly you ended up with awards. So uh, the university asked me to represent. So 
uh, I entered this uh, competition in UUM uh, four years after I developed the kit. Uh, not immediately after I developed, but after four years, then uh, university asked me to represent, uh, ended up to have this award. And uh, again, in 2017, uh, having this uh, APRS award, uh, Johan, I uh, still remember Dr. Ma'an was one of the panel uh, to evaluate uh, this uh, category. And also it ended up in the proceedings uh, and also sharing of knowledge in uh, conferences and it ended up having research grants. Okay, So things that you never imagine but the focus initially was on the student learning, ended up with all these, uh, uh, what we call that uh, achievement. Okay, this thing doesn't stop here. Having this kit allows me to also share knowledge with the farmers. So we collaborate together with the Polytechnic uh, College Community, eh, Jerantut in Pahang. So we conduct training to the farmers on how to conduct a breeding program to produce better quality fish. See? You can see here it's being conducted in Kuala Lumpur where the kit is not only used for students, but it's also being used to train the farmers. And again, it didn't stop here. Due to the pandemic, this is what I'm, I'm trying to tell you in pursuit of becoming a great educator. It is a journey to achieve a certain stage. Previously, you can see that the kit is, uh, is, is meant to be conducted face to face. But due to the pandemic, I was able to transform the kit using Google platform and make this kit online and which they conduct the lab exercise online, collaborating together at different area using Google Slide. So the advantage of having this is that they have the creativity. Previously, I designed the board, but now we let the students to be creative in designing their own fishing ponds, breeding ponds, uh, this is an example of one of the group. Okay. I have seven groups at that time. Each seven groups design their own. So online learning actually inspires them to be more creative. And now not only I have one design of the fishing pond, I have now eight design of the fishing pond because it was contributed by the creativity of each uh, student group. So I managed to transform and conduct this online and uh, they're able to do it. You can see here, this is uh, the top. Uh, I can monitor their progress online and they are doing this collaborating with each other. So again, this is, I would like to uh, stress again, the pursuit of becoming a great educator never ends. Yeah? It's not a destination, but you keep on uh, trying to improve to ensure that you give the best to the students. <clears throat> okay. Uh, several other kits that I would like to share is uh, the fish uh, gym pro. Okay. Uh, this is another kit in which we train them to understand about the genetics. Uh, these are the farmers, eh? the breeders, uh, the fighting fish breeder. So we train them. And again, due to the pandemic, I transformed this uh, board game into online using Google Slide platform, which uh, I teach the, uh, my students last year. Okay. So the need to be creative again and innovative uh, in trying to give the best to the student. Uh, another 
second one is uh, the card. Uh, this is what I'm now I'm trying to transform for this coming uh, semester. Uh, sorry, for this uh, September semester. Uh, again, for this uh, online learning. So, uh, as you can see here, it is not only about your innovation, okay? But apart from here, they also wanted to see your knowledge sharing and also your academic leadership. So just to give you a brief, uh, I've managed to attend conferences and uh, present papers regarding my research in teacher and learning. I've managed to do the research. Uh, I was involved with uh, KPT, with the team, to uh, be able to contribute in producing the playbook for alternative assessment. And uh, I was also appointed as a committee member for certain task force in UMT and as well as uh, in uh, KPT. So uh, I will share to you the file and uh, feel free to have a look and uh, ask me anything if uh, you are not uh, you're not clear of when you uh, look at my teaching portfolio. My teaching portfolio may not be the best in terms of the design, but uh, hope that what is inside there can be uh, helpful for all of you in trying to understand uh, about the pursuit of trying to provide the best to your students. So finally, uh, the things that I would like to summarize here okay, is uh, in order for you to teach, you must remember that you need to have not only the knowledge of your content that you want to deliver, but you need to have the knowledge on how to deliver. So always develop your learning culture. And never stop learning. Even I myself, uh, never stop learning until now. Just want to, uh, to show to you uh, what I mean. <clears throat> okay, these are among the, the references that I read. Uh, up until now, I place it in uh, Microsoft OneNote. Uh, you can see the list of uh, articles that I've uh, gone through um, up until now. So again, I said never stop learning. This one is where I can get from Facebook, uh, some in terms of Google, uh, technology in teaching, Google Suite. So learning never ends. Okay. Uh, regarding Jamboard, because I use a lot of uh, Google, understanding, learning style. So this is what I meant. Don't stop learning. Learning can happen anywhere. Uh, this is the one that I took from, uh, from for example, the, uh, the internet, uh, not including the one in uh, YouTube, where I, com I compile it into the, uh, the YouTube list, okay? all the videos. Uh, regarding teaching and learning. So this is what I meant, never stop learning. And the second one is respect and appreciate your colleague and staff. You need to understand that becoming an educator is not a one-man show. You want to teach uh, if we look into the actual one face to face, you need to go to the classroom. You must remember that somebody takes care of the classroom. You are not there opening all the lights. You are not there sweeping the floor after each class. Somebody else is taking care of your class. Somebody else is taking care of the facilities inside there. Okay? And need to remember that when you go to the university, you feel safe because 
there is a security guard who takes care that everything in the university are not being stolen. Okay, just imagine your office is not safe and you take you need to take all your important documents anywhere that you go. The feeling of unsafe, but we are grateful because we have security guards taking care and allow us to really focus on our actual task. Okay? And those who have labs, we need to remember that we have lab staff who will prepare all our stuff before we start to teach. And they are the ones who clear the lab. Okay? Uh, I've seldom seen lecturers preparing all the chemicals and then doing the teaching after that, clearing and cleaning up all the things. Okay? Everything is being helped by the staff, the lab staff, and also the science, uh, science officers. Okay? Uh, not only that, a lot of things, your computers are being taken care of the, the, your IT department. Okay? So all this, you just imagine if you need to do this on your own. Okay? So we are being grateful because we have a team in the university that do all these things that allow us to focus really on the teaching and learning. So success is about teamwork. Okay? You need to work together with all those uh, colleague. That's why uh, appreciation, being appreciative and being respectful is, is important. And finally, the focus is always on the student. Whatever you do, your desire to improve is for the student learning. Then other things Allah will give you later. And uh, the last part is Whatever that you do, uh, as a Muslim, always focus to get blessings and barakah from Allah. There's no point of doing things just for the sake of uh, achieving something, but the way that you achieve is without ethics, without integrity. You may feel happy and successful, but at the end of the day, what we care about is the points that are being counted when we face Allah. Uh, uh, in Akhirat. So, all this that you achieve, remember that is only uh, dunya, but what we are trying to achieve, we always pray that it is also being counted so that we don't bring an empty pail, kosong, uh, when we meet Allah in Akhirat. So, finally, Uh, I would like to thank the star of the show, uh, that is the students. They make this thing happen. I will be a crazy man if there is no student. So you're becoming like a crazy person teaching without any students. Okay, But I think a lot of us has encountered that, that situation when we do our teaching online, where everybody closed the camera. So we feel that experience before, right? We teach, but we feel that I am a crazy man going to Tanjung Rambutan because everybody closed the camera, so we don't know they are there or not. So you have that experience when we do online learning. But again, it's different from the crazy men who are at the traffic light trying to teach uh, people having no students at all. So these are the stars of the show. I would like to take this opportunity inviting me uh, again. Thank you very much uh, for trusting uh, and uh, giving me the opportunity and uh, to UMT for providing me the platform for me to uh, provide uh, the best to the students and all my mentors uh, who have uh, taught me a lot and guided me in uh, uh, becoming an academician, especially in teaching and learning, uh, apart from research. Uh, my parents and uh, my family will be very supportive. And again, <clears throat> just to highlight, uh, <clears throat> thanks to everyone uh, who have given their attention uh, to my talk. So with this, uh, thank you again. Assalamualaikum.
warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh so i open to any uh, question coming from the audience thank you thank you dr shariza for your sharing of uh, how on the journey of being a great educator is actually a journey of self improvement uh, that along the way you may get awarded with uh, with awards external awards but it's the self improvement of being an educator that is the most important and for uh, reminding us uh, about our the importance of nia uh, when uh, educating so uh, we would like to open for any questions from the floor but before that if i can squeeze in one simple question before yes. everybody else asks uh, i'm uh, personally i'm very new a baby educator <laughs> only two years maybe after my phd so uh, I, I find that on this journey that you speak of the journey of being a great educator mine is perhaps a journey of uh, trying to be at least a decent one, a decent, if not a great one, then at least first a decent educator. So if, if uh, do you have any um, uh, advice for new educators like me who often struggle with uh, imposter syndrome? I often, when I'm, I'm teaching, I, I look around and think, what am I doing here? Am I really teaching all these medical students? Uh, so because sometimes it feels like my students are smarter than me, <laughs> uh, and which is good, I feel in a way. But is there any advice you can give uh, to us newbies, new educators on how to uh, use, I mean, flip this feeling to our advantage instead of uh, it being a Disadvantages to us. Uh, okay, thank you, thank you, Dr. Hidayatun, for <clears throat> for asking. Well, uh, I I want to uh, to answer this. I would like to share my experience when I first uh, was asked by my senior lecturer to teach a certain topic. I was a tutor at that time, and then suddenly. Uh, the lecturer asked me, Shah, can, can you help me to cover this topic? So I haven't had any experience. Uh, what you need to do is, uh, what I did is, I tried to prepare, okay, uh, make a preparation, and um, just go along. The focus is, I always ask myself, what if the student will ask like this? What if the student trying to be cheeky? What is the student trying to, 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 what if the student knows more than you? Okay, so the, the preparation, that's one, number one. The preparation, thinking ahead is very important so that you are always well prepared. Uh, uh, rather than okay, I need to teach, this is a, a, a new experience. So you just go to the classroom and then you, you start to, uh, to deliver. Okay, even though you have a plan, okay, this is the first five minutes, I will talk about this. The, first, the next 10 minutes, I will do this activity. Okay, it's good. That is the, 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 the actual thing that we need to do. But apart from that, preparing, uh, what I can say is preparing for the worst. That worst may never come, but it's better to prepare. Like I said just now, what if things like this, what is like this? So that you're, you always have something in your pocket. That is number one. Number two, uh, now based on my experience, we need to have this one thing in mind of two things. One, student knows more than us. Second, student doesn't know anything. Okay, why I said we need to encounter this. I give you an example. I teach one course apart from my subject. They call it fishery science. In fishery science, we teach students about the world of fisheries. So we, we give them an introduction. This is a course for first year students to give them a view of what fisheries industry is all about. So we introduce them about the topic, the fish, 
resources, the fisheries exploitation, how fish, fish are being caught, how fish are being managed. Having in mind these two things, there are some students who are expert than us, there are some students who don't know nothing, it's good because you can leverage them. You must remember that knowledge doesn't mean that it must come from your mouth. Okay? The current one is sometimes you facilitate that thing. Okay, what I'm trying to relate is, going back to the subject that I'm teaching, there are students always, there are always students in my class who knows more. They look at the fish, they already know the species because that is their hobby. Fisheries recreational. Every day they will go to the sea and uh, with their fishing rod and catch a fish. So they know more about the fish and there are some who didn't know anything about fish. So by understanding that, you will plan your strategy. Okay, how to uh, strategize in which you can ensure the people who knows more teach the others and the student who doesn't know will try to learn by themselves and being taught by your students, the, the one that, that knows more. So what, what I'm trying to, to, to inform you is, number two is strategize by understanding your student. Uh, that that is, the, is the reason why in my philosophy, I held into these three, flexible and diversify. Because when we do this survey, I always do a survey uh, called learning style. There are four types of learning style. You can see a difference. Okay, one, there are some students who need time to digest, then only they can act. You will notice this when you do a group discussion, suddenly you see some students still don't start off the discussion. They become blurred. They become blurred not because they are underperforming. These students take time. There are some students who don't need you to, to explain. They are always wanting to do. Okay, they are active learners. Okay, there are some of the students that you need to give them some guidelines or notes. Okay, and there are some that are pragmatic. They don't want to listen from you. Just tell me what is this thing related to the actual work. Okay, uh, we don't need. Do, we don't want to listen to any theories. We don't want to listen to any principle. Okay, what is what is actually this thing, and how does it relate? Uh, so, if you are able to analyze the student's profile, then this will help you to design your teaching and learning. Uh, these are the things that uh, will help all of you. So, number one, expect the worst so that you can prepare, you can discuss with your seniors, your mentors, how to do this. What happens if the student doesn't want to react? What happens if the student sometimes asks you things that you yourself need to check? So, you prepare ahead, one thing. Second, get the student profile so that when you understand the student profile, it helps you on how to strategize. Now, having this thing will enable you to reduce your stress. Okay, uh, that's the thing. Number three, the last one is have a positive uh, mindset. What I mean positive mindset? Anything that happened in the classroom, always think that, don't think that, don't think, what, I mean, what I'm trying to tell is, don't think negative about the student. Okay, I've experienced this a lot. I'll give you one example. Uh, last time when I teach one class, there is a boy. When he sit down on the class, he will just uh, sander, relax, put on his feet, uh, up, okay, looking macam, I can say, it's not the, the right term, like macam kurang ajar, but in 
my Facebook. Okay, I created the the subject, the group, uh, my uh, Facebook. The most active person who interacts, if I conduct any activity in teacher and learning, is that person. Uh, you see, so that that are the things that will reduce your stress, your nervousness when you are uh, teaching. Because there are some who are very active in class, but they are not active outside. Uh, and in the pandemic, during this pandemic, it's more crucial. Okay? Uh, I have one experience in which students didn't submit the exam. Okay? Uh, we know that it is the responsible of the student to inform. So I take the urge of uh, contacting the student through WhatsApp. So just to say that, okay, I understand maybe you have a problem. So may I know why you didn't submit? And then the student informed me, sorry, doctor, uh, my grandmother is in ICU right now because of COVID-19. Uh, see, uh, so that is what I'm trying to say. Not having a negative perception is important that helps you reduce your stress. But I don't deny it, even though you have a positive feeling, we don't deny that some students are really uh, nakal. We know, we know that. Uh, but these are the things that I can uh, advise. The, the fourth, the last one is there are a lot of uh, references on, uh, like I showed to you, methods on how to get the student engaged. Okay, so practice a lot. Uh, I myself takes about, I think, starting from 2006. So more than 10 years uh, to keep on improving, improving, improving. Okay, uh, so if you look at me, 15 years ago, uh, I might not be like this. What I mean, not be like this, not be an AAN winner, no. Not having the experience of handling various diverse uh, attitude of student. Okay, uh, having a calm mind, not thinking about the, the, the student's attitude compared to what I was 15 years ago. Uh, so time also uh, uh, is, uh, plays an important factor, but time itself includes together with your effort of testing and testing and testing. Because some, if you keep on doing the same thing, you will never get the experience and you don't improve. So I hope what I said uh, can uh, somehow or other assist in uh, answering your question. Thank you, Teacher Reza. You helped a lot, inshallah. So uh, maybe we have time for one more question. Okay, we have one question from Dr. Atia um, uh, in the chat box. Uh, do you, sorry. Uh, do you have, I think, do you have a team that helps you or gives you ideas to help you in designing your teaching and learning um, stuff, I think? Uh, again, uh, I didn't see in my chat box. You, yes, uh, do you have, uh, sorry, or is it or is just in mind, sorry. Okay. Do you have a team that helps you or gives you ideas to help you in designing your teaching, teaching and learning, um, I think, uh, things that you use for teaching and learning. <clears throat> okay. Or... In designing that thing? Yes. Okay. Of course, I have a team. Uh, and uh, do you know who are my team? My team is a student. Let's say I said the, the star of the show is the student. Why? <clears throat> because whatever I do is for them. So when I design something, after I design, I will call upon several students and ask their opinion. Because they are the one who will be experiencing it. That is, that is the, the, major, the major team members. So uh, take for example, just to share you one experience. When I start to improvise the kit that I have developed, I work with one of my ex-students. He was my uh, final year student. 
uh, I took him as an uh, RA for my for that research. So we worked together because he was my student last time. And I asked him, okay, I'm trying to design this. I'm trying to design this. So what do you think? Because I'm trying to look into the student's perspective. In lecturer's perspective, there's no problem because uh, we can discuss among lecturers uh, to see. So from then on, we get the feedback and we improve. Second, I will conduct a short uh, activity, uh, initial activity. Then I will ask the feedback from them, what do they think? Uh, so to me, I consider the students are my team members, but strategizing in that way. Uh, second, uh, I also have discussion. In a proper team member, in terms of that, I don't have a proper team member uh, in the lecturer section. Uh, what I do most is I go around and I discuss uh, having to get the opinions. Okay, but again, I advise don't follow me in terms of not having a team member in terms of lecturers. Okay, uh, because uh, one thing that I would like to share, currently now, a lot of my colleagues, they form a team. Okay, I told you that because when they form a team, some of them get my advice. So that is how come I came to know about, okay, they have a team members in, uh, in doing certain things. Okay, why I would suggest to have a team member because I can see that this team that sometimes I, I work together with to, to give them some uh, gui guidance, they work very fast. Okay, they, no, not that they work very fast, they achieve things much faster because they work together as a team. And they move more, much more better compared to when you're working alone or you're working with the student. That is why when I do things uh, at that particular time, it took me about five years to properly develop and expand them. But uh, with some of my colleagues, I can give you three groups. Okay, their development of the kids, of the method that they do, is much greater and better. Uh, so as for me, again, just to find it, uh, summary up the, to answer the question, in my case, <coughs> I don't have a proper team member. My team member is a student itself, but it's good to have a team member because based on my experience, <coughs> the one that I've uh, observed, they develop much better and faster and they go further. Some of them, <coughs> have the chance to get grants for, from the agency. Uh, and some of them having grants for knowledge transfer uh, when they work together as a team. Thank you. I hope this answers the question. Yes, thank you, Dr. Shah. Uh, many hands and many brains make like the work. Yeah? Uh, yeah. Final question, since we are running out of time for the question answer session. So final question that has been submitted to me. Uh, what does UNP do to help you to prepare and submit for mm -hmm. AAN or any other competitions? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> uh, what I experience is different to the, the up and coming batch. Because uh, as for me, I considered myself uh, UMT's first experience. Uh, so after this first experience, I can say things get much better in UMT. Not because of me, uh, but because of the experience that they, they face together. Okay. Uh, I explain in, in uh, two perspectives. Perspective number one, my experience. When I try to attend the APRS, the one that, uh, or currently now the name ACRI, Okay, preparing the videos, preparing the things are all being done by myself. Okay, uh, university only assists me in covering my traveling expenses and also uh, in the participation, right? Uh, and also the cost for poster printing. But the printing, the design of the posters, the videos and everything, all are being done by me. But after that, we assembled a team to assist uh, other candidates. Okay. 
in terms of AAN, it's the same. The university assists me in uh, printing costs. Uh, they assist me in designing the cover, the front cover. But everything inside there, the design are being done by me and uh, assist by my wife. That's why credit goes to my wife for the portfolio because she helped me to design the inner part. Uh, the university didn't assist that. Not, not to say that university don't want to help, but uh, preparing that time, that thing is, is a last minute thing. It's a one month last minute. So that's why I say the first experience, the MP first experience. But after my experience now, UMT has, uh, has, I can say, has a better preparation. They have a team uh, to take videos, uh, to make the videos, and also to prepare this, uh, the, the design and so on and so forth. Uh, that is, that is uh, the, the second, the, the, uh, the first perspective. Now, another perspective, what UMT provide for the preparation is the process of improvement. Uh, that is the thing, under talent development. Okay, uh, What I didn't explain to this time around compared to last time when I was invited is, I was grouped in the uh, UMT talent pool for academic teaching leadership. So, okay, what is the benefit of having that is, having that pool, any program conducted by ACAP they will send these people to attend, including me. And we have a team in which, apart from that, they will expose me to be a member in some of the committee at the national level. But this is not the strategy to win AAN, as I told you, but to expose so that when I uh, got involved in, at the national level, so my experience will assist the university in developing other talents and also the, the, the development of academic activities in UMT. That is the, the major purpose, to develop what we call academic leadership in teaching and learning. But due to this activity conducted by our talent development program, so apart from that, that is where it assists me in fulfilling all those criteria that is needed. So in preparing for the final one, maybe for my case, UMT is not uh, contributing a lot in the preparing the document, so on and so forth, but preparing me to having the experience and content uh, throughout my journey, that is where UMT contributed a lot. But I don't explain here because uh, if, for example, CPD wants to know more further on how uh, UMT uh, experience in developing talents, um, for example, like me, I'd be happy to share with uh, the CPD or uh, IAUM CPD uh, department uh, to, uh, to share the, uh, what we did and uh, maybe it can assist uh, CPD also in uh, developing and preparing uh, IIUM's uh, future uh, AAN or other competition candidate. I'm sure the the uh, is very happy to hear that. Uh, uh, so yes, not only the students learning, the lecturers learning, but also the universities learning. Eh? Yes. Academic sustainability. I mean, Correct. not just one person, but the uh, the future academicians as well. So thank you very much, Dr. Shariza, for your sharing and also for answering all the questions. I have a request that uh, we take one photo session now uh, with uh, everybody here present. Um, so if and everybody can. Uh, switch on their cameras and uh, give their best and brightest smile so that we can have something, a memento of uh, this occasion. So maybe we can, uh, who's taking the photo? Maybe somebody from the office? Give me a second. Okay, just. The view, gallery, 
Okay, so everybody can switch on their cameras now, inshallah. So uh, if nobody is taking the photo, I will take the photo. Because <laughs> it seems uh, multitasking, eh? MC multitasking, photographer as well. So everybody smile. Uh, with, okay, and anyone else want to switch on their cameras? Okay, so we will take a photo. Okay, say cheese. Okay, one. Okay, second one. Second page. We have not forgotten about you. Okay, smile. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, <laughs> the, there was a problem with the official camera. So we only have the unofficial camera manner. <laughs> so thank you again, Dr. Shariza. Uh, so, um, we have another speaker lined up, uh, but uh, for the first, I think the first half of the session has been very um, fruitful. And I hope that uh, we have uh, learned a lot about um, the, uh, Dr. Shariza's uh, sharing session on how to become a great educator, which I believe is the potential in uh, in all of us, inshallah. Um, and we now proceed to our second guest uh, speaker, esteemed speaker. Uh, so our second speaker for today is Associate Professor Dr. Un Chen In. Uh, she is uh, an Associate Professor with the Institute for Research in Molecular Medicine, or uh, INFORM in University Science Malaysia. Uh, she completed her uh, uh, Bachelor of Science, First Class Honours in Biotechnology at University Kebangsaan Malaysia and uh, furthered her um, uh, PhD in Medical Oncology at the University of Oxford in United Kingdom. And then she trained in Karolinska Institute in Sweden as a postdoctoral fellow. And she's currently serving in USM. So uh, Dr. Un Chen In is a member of the Global Young Academy, a fellow of the Association of Union of International Cancer Control, and an ambassador for the European Association uh, for cancer research. So she has served as an ESCO member of the Young Scientist Network or Academy Science of uh, Malaysia from 2016 and 2018. Uh, she has won multiple awards and uh, including the Exicon Young Scientist Award, uh, Southeast Asia, the prestigious L'Oreal UNESCO for Women in Science National Fellowship, uh, and also um, the Union for International Cancer Control ICRAD Fellowship and the National Cancer Council uh, Cancer Research Award. Uh, sorry, there's so many of the awards that uh, it's, it's a long list. And she's also awarded the UK Best Press UK-based prestigious Women of Future Award, Southeast Asia, and a National Young Scientist Award from the Malaysian Ministry of Science and Technology in 2018. And in 2019, she was awarded the Promising Academician Award uh, from the Academy, uh, uh, the, the uh, upper Malaysian Ministry of Education eh, from AAN. So, uh, recently, she's added to the British Council Study UK Alumni uh, Award as well for professional excellence, uh, professional achievement uh, category and the Excellence Service Medal by the Malaysian Ministry of Education uh, and the Malaysian Invention Design Society Minds Women Scientist Award. So basically, uh, Dr. Uh, Associate Professor Dr. Un Chen In's uh, CV is full of awards. <laughs> So we can spend the next hour reading all your awards or we can listen to her sharing. So I'm sure that everybody would prefer to hear from uh, the prestigious speaker herself. So I would like to open the floor to uh, Dr. Uncha In. Uh, maybe she will go to the molecular details on how she achieved all that she has achieved uh, to date. So Dr. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Very good morning, Salam Sejahtera. Thank you very much, Dr. Hidayato, uh, for the kind introduction. Um, I'm just going to share my screen, if you don't mind. So can you see the screen now? 
Yes, sir. Yes, good. Okay. Um, thank you very much uh, to the organizers at the International Islamic University in Malaysia uh, for inviting me uh, to give a talk and to share my personal journey with uh, the participants. Um, I won the Anugrah Academic Harapan Negara back in 2019. And before I start, I would like to say that I completely agree with uh, Professor Shariza Sharif um, when he mentioned that AAN focuses more on the journey as well as the personal vision as an academician rather than you know the strategies to win awards, right? Because for me, I've also never strategized to win these awards. It was mostly due to the journey that I've been through that were full of ups and downs, and I am planning to share this with you. So my sharing session would actually involve two parts. The first part would be on my journey as a young scientist, um, not so young now, but <laughs> I started off as a young scientist and now kind of an um, early or to mid, um, mid career, although I'm still under 40, <laughs> I have to say. And the second part would be on the application of the AAN award. Okay, so I wanted to share this with uh, many of the young scientists because I think and I hope that this will be able to inspire the young scientists because uh, when I first got started, um, after I came back um, from the UK and Sweden, um, I was told a lot that my research did not fit in. I actually trained in molecular oncology and coming back to Malaysia at that time, um, I think there was this very big hype about natural products. People were using natural products uh, as treatments for cancers or as alternative therapies. And there were a lot of fundings that were being pumped into this and so much hype about that, that whatever that I worked on was literally not well understood, but also kind of uh, um, not on the surface, you know, they were basically just always underwater. And I really struggled at that time working in this area. But I also had the um, motto, I told myself, you know, I never really want to do something just so that I fit in. I would be happy to get trained in something and come back and I would be happy to uh, help, you know, achieve the vision and mission of an institution, but never really think of myself as a scientist who trained in one area and expected to kind of work on something else. So for me, I always felt that fitting in makes you an expert at doing what people want. But at the end of the day is what you are really passionate about that keeps you going, right? So what am I actually working on? I actually specialize in targeted cancer therapy. And truth is um, 10 years ago, you know, nobody really understood what targeted therapies are. Although, you know, they are already being used in a hospital, but research wise, not many people understood. So at that time, being a young scientist, I, I was actually in a lot of dilemma. Number one, being constantly told that I did not fit in, you know, how, how much damage it did to my self-confidence at that time, you know, wondering what is actually wrong with me or, or you know, is, is the way I think, is it, is it wrong? Should I not pursue something that I love doing as a scientist? You know, so should I actually let go or try to push through? So there were a lot of challenges that I have been through. And then I started writing um, layman articles because I thought, okay, if nobody understood what I was working on and, you know, always challenging me. And, you know, whenever I applied for grants, I received comments that for me was, uh, you know, the, the comments were clearly not, based on facts and, and that kind of made me realize that it's actually the level of understanding um, from many of the academicians as well as the, the lay people. So that's when I got started writing um, layman articles and I also started working with Magna National Cancer Council in um, public education. So I did a lot of outreach, public education and scientific communication as a result of all these struggles that I have been through. And I also had at the back of my mind, I was very thankful that I had very good mentors back in the UK. And this is a very important advice and I would like to share with all the young researchers out there. So the first five years, 
post PhD are actually very crucial because these are the years that you use to actually build your track record and develop your niche area. And I have been very thankful also because throughout these five years, I focused on actually lab attachments, going to international uh, labs, uh, universities, and learn from the best. I was thankful for the opportunities and also very thankful to my organization for actually not giving me too many admin jobs because at that time, I would not have been able to handle admin jobs and also building my research at the same time. So if it, uh, for many of the young ones, if, if, if you are still in your first five years, please uh, really focus on building your research track record and your niche area. Because once you hit 40 and over, you are going to have less and less opportunities. If you don't make it now, it's going to be very hard for you to compete with um, you know, the big fish out there after you hit 40, okay? And the second thing is, um, what are you actually passionate about in life? What is your purpose in life? For me, it was about volunteering at cancer hospitals. And, um, you know, when you are in cancer hospitals, you actually meet uh, people at the terminal stage of the disease. And you know deep down that, you know, today may very much be the last day I interact with you or I talk to you. And, you know, it's the pain and suffering that you go through. And with that in mind, I always told myself, you know, I'm a cancer researcher, so I'm going to try to find a way. I'm trying to find a new treatment for cancer or whatever I can. I'm going to always devote my life to finding treatments for cancer. And when you have discovered the purpose in your life, then you start to explore all the possibilities uh, that you have in order to achieve what you want to achieve. Or, and most importantly, I feel, is to actually be really focused on what you want to do. Um, there are many young researchers out there, you know, being very, um, they're stressed because they have certain KPIs to meet, you know. Yeah, so there's a certain numbers, uh, quantities they have to tick off the checklist. But for me, it has never been like that. I've never really worked for KPI, but rather I, I, I was always very focused on what I wanted to do. And I would tend to try to achieve that one thing. And along the way, um, you know, like what Prof. Shariza said, I was very blessed because then these awards came in, but it was never me trying to strategize to win certain awards, but rather who I am as a scientist and what I envision, what vision I have, um, that really led me to these awards, okay? Um, so as young scientists, um, I, I'm very much aware that there are always doubts in our mind because we were, okay, I was young and we are young, okay? And you know, you always, have this self-confidence issue, whether you're doing things right or, or not, and having mentors are so important. But when I came back to Malaysia, I didn't really have the mentors um, to teach me or to guide me. I mean, there are two, two groups of young researchers. One, I guess, who are very lucky and who have mentors. And the other one pretty much you know, left to kind of fight their way through and I was kind of the latter. But it's okay. I mean, these are challenges, right? And I have to always be thankful, and I am, that it's because of these challenges, I, I realized what I could actually do and what I couldn't do. I know my limits then, and I tried very hard to stay afloat. So first of all, we have to actually accept that we have limitations. Coming back from abroad is easy to, um, you know, compare what we had previously and what we have now and try to do whatever we were trained to do then, which is actually quite difficult to do back in Malaysia, right? So we have to first be able to accept that we have these limitations and we must be willing to work around these issues. Um, so I, I, I started working with uh, people, uh, collaborators, my ex-boss and my ex-mentors, and also apply for fellowships, go abroad, train with uh, scientists, uh, like-minded scientists, you know, people who actually understand your work, because without that, you'll always be confined in this environment where you know people are already doing what they know and so it's saturated, nothing new is coming in, no new ideas are coming in. 
So it's important to actually open your mind, work with different people outside Malaysia. And also, it's also very important to begin small. I must say that this is how I got started because, um, you know, coming back from overseas, of course, we have big ambitions, right? Um, we think that we have this knowledge and skills that we, we brought back from overseas. And then, so we started to want to apply for big grants. So I started applying for these big grants from Mosti. And then, you know, they got rejected. And then I started looking at the comments. I was like, mm, okay, so maybe I'm not good enough. Or maybe they wanted uh, preliminary findings. Um, how do I get preliminary findings when I don't even have any funding to get started with? So I started uh, re-strategizing. Maybe I should actually go for smaller grants. So I've mentioned previously, there are a lot of opportunities for under 40. You know, there's this uh, Ranji Pat Wensen grant, um, Magna National Cancer Council, um, Cancer Research Award grant, and this Laurel Fellowship grant. So I started um, actually rewriting my rejected proposals for the bigger grants, and I started submitting to all these smaller grants. And I must say that, you know, at first I was thinking, oh my goodness, 30,000 for one grant, that's not a lot. In fact, I finished off the 30,000 with my Ranji Patwan Singh, that was my first small grant within the first year and had nothing left. But, you know, actually, I realized that it's these small grants that actually piled the foundation for me. Actually, it, it was the prestige that did it for me um, at the same time. I didn't realize that. I mean, we are always aiming for the bigger picture, but we have to realize that sometimes it's the baby steps that count, right? So for me, um, when I received about one same grant and then the Magna Cancer Research Grant and Laurel, um, doors started opening for me. I, number one, I, I managed to get uh, preliminary results with this funding, but not only that, it was a prestige that came with that and also the um, highlights of my work. You know, people started to understand my work because suddenly, um, you know, when you when win these prestigious awards, people want to know about your work. So that was how I got started. Uh, I also believe in benchmarking myself against international scientists if possible, because there's only so much we can do back in Malaysia. But if the field that you're working on is not something that is common, you might as well really benchmark yourself against the real players out there. Okay. And lastly, you will never be able to reach perfection as I believe there's always room improve for improvement at every stage of our career. I mean, what last year, if I submitted a grant and then it got rejected, and then to this year, if I want to uh, work on that grant application again, if I look back at what I wrote last year, I wonder, why did I actually write that? You know, oh, I shouldn't have written that. So every time you write and every time you submit anything for application, and it, if they get rejected, you know, it's always good to look back again next year and then you'll see the reason why because we grow every year from trying and failing right okay and i've never believed that there's a uh, such thing as a bad idea because i believe that you know there are no ideas that are bad you know you can have many different ideas and and so what if they are not good but you know whenever you have all these small small ideas and you discuss them eventually they will lead you to one great idea, right? It's the process that is actually extremely valuable. And I actually had this eye-opening session um, when I had um, a discussion for a project proposal for a -Star, uh, with A-Star Singapore. I realized that, oh my goodness, I only know so much, you know, in my field here. But when you discuss with the real players out there, they can tell you, oh, this idea, okay, it may not be that good, um, you know, they actually push you to think what's next, what's next, and then the next level until you suddenly think, oh, what if you can nail two pathways at the same time rather than one pathway in order to cure cancer? Wouldn't that be good? You know, so it, it's actually a very good thing when you're able to discuss your ideas uh, with professors or with, the, uh, with very good scientists out there. Okay, I also learned to do good science uh, first by being told a thousand times that I've done it wrong. I mean, I, I don't think I was born a scientist. 
In fact, I wanted to be a fashion designer, you see. So you see where my head is at. Um, but I realized that having good mentors and a good education is so important. I've actually learned how to be a good scientist back in Oxford, to be honest. Um, at that time, I was very neat, you know, coming from this traditional background that you are never really um, encouraged to, to, to speak up. You know, you kind of always have to accept things for how they are. And back in Oxford, I was challenged to actually discuss my ideas and don't care if they're wrong. You know, nobody is going to tell me that, oh, you're wrong and your ideas are ridiculous, you know. So from there, I learned to gain self-confidence and to know that, um, you know, these ideas, no matter how small they are, they are always room for growth. So, um, it's, you know, I've also mentioned previously about coming back to Malaysia and knowing that we have so many limitations. So how do we actually work on something that are not commonly worked on in Malaysia with all these limitations, but I always have to tell myself, you know, there are limitations, but don't let the limitations limit you. Although I must admit to you, there were days that I really felt like giving up. <laughs> there were days that I really felt that maybe I'm not in the right place to push for this to move. Uh, but, you know, there's always this thing called hope. And as long as you hope, you have hope, you will always find ways to try to stay afloat. Okay. So that's basically the story of my journey and why I wanted to share with you is because I believe that that makes me the scientist I am today. And because of that, it lays a foundation um, for me to actually try to apply for the Anugra Academic Harapan Nigara. So if you, if you go to the uh, website, all these you can obtain from the AANN website. Okay, you can only receive this um, award once in your entire life. And the Sharat Pomohonan, uh, three I highlighted here because I think they're very important. First of all, you must menerajui uh, bidang pengajaran and pembelajaran, penyelidikan dan inovasi, perkhidmatan and kepimpinan akademik secara holistic. So they want to look at you as an uh, all-rounder, not so much as being really good at only one thing, but an all-rounder and your personal visions as, a, as an academician, okay? And secondly, to mempamekan pujahan bidang kepakaran yang merangkali selaman. I always wonder if it's because of my struggles, you know, trying to work on something that is not commonly worked on, that maybe, you know, may come across as kepakaran yang merangkali selaman. But actually, to be honest with you, we are very much lagging um, in this field in Malaysia, probably 10 years. So maybe it's like working to my advantage just because I really try to follow through what I work on. And uh, lastly, uh, the import, one of the important um, syarat is to mempamekan wawasan dan hala tuju dalam kerjaya akademik. Oh, well, again, you know, it's not so much about having the quantity and having a checklist, I've achieved this, I've achieved this, and therefore, you know, I submit this application to you because I've achieved, but rather how you want to improve yourself, how you want to improve this research in Malaysia, how you actually envision for whatever that you have achieved, you know, to contribute to the nation and to society. So pretty much, I think this lays a foundation for this award. Right, and I before I applied for this award, I actually had a look at this top in mind. So it's actually uh, uploaded by the AAN uh, on YouTube. So you can actually have a look, uh, watch and see what they're actually looking for. But for me, I actually received a phone call from USM and that time Dato Asma was the DC, right? So um, I was very thankful because uh, USM actually has a committee to look into that, to do the pencalonan and to actually vet your applications and to work on you with the application all the way to coming up with a hard bound. And they actually send people all the way to Putrajaya, you know, to make sure that there's nothing lost in the, in the in, in the pro, pro process of uh, delivery of all the hardbound copies, okay? But actually, we, we had to do this uh, online too. It's just that the hardbound copy is also as a, a supplement to the soft copies. So at that time, I was already seven months pregnant and I received this call from, from USM Top Management. I wasn't sure whether I wanted to go ahead or not because I know the timeline is very crucial and the application forms, but there was a lot. And you know what is, um, required, what was required from me at that time was actually 
put together all my Bahan Bukti and have them uh, certified one by one. And I was only given one month to prepare and submit. But okay, never mind. If, if the university had um, um, had me as one of the chalon, okay, I took it. One thing you have to bear in mind as a young scientist, whenever there's any opportunities that come up, you have to grab them because opportunities don't always come your way. And especially for young scientists, you know, we are not big established professors where, you know, we always get opportunities and people coming up to you and say, you know, oh, I invite you to do this, you know, do that, or to give a talk, or, you know, to be part of this and that. It was never like that. As young scientists, it's a lot of, you have to prove yourself first. So at that time, okay, I took up the challenge and I said, okay, I take that one month and I focus and I try to have all my applications put together. And this is how the application form uh, looked like. So everything was done online. And I think, I believe that uh, it is still so um, this year. Um, basically, they wanted to know um, your kapimpinan, right? So whatever you have, uh, to show your ability to lead your leadership skills, you should actually uh, put them in. So one thing good about USM is we have this uh, campus online that whatever we have, we actually actually scan and put into the system. So what I had to do was just to look for all this um, bahan bukti and take them out and print them and have them certified. So so I have them all ready already, not that I have to dig into my piles of uh, papers uh, in boxes, you know, to try to file for this application. So if you're a committee member of anything or a head of secretariat or invited speakers, preferably plenary or keynote, it's always uh, at your advantage, okay? And I was also a visiting scientist. Remember I mentioned that I did a lot of lab attachment um, overseas, right? Just because I really needed to learn from the best. And at that time, I also needed to use the facilities to move my research. I would do anything at a time to stay afloat because I didn't want my research to sink, right? So later did I know that, you know, all these things were working to my advantage just because I was really very focused on achieving what I wanted to achieve. You know, just like what Prof. Sharita Sharif mentioned earlier. Okay, and then I had to complete two essays. The first one was Sila Nyatakan Puncapayan Utama dan Perihalkan Impak Puncapayan. Ini serta Nyatakan Wawasan dan Halatuju dalam Perjaya Akademik Pemohon. So, you know, to be given um, this essay and having to write it in 500 words was, of course, uh, a big challenge because it's very easy to just write and write and write, but then to actually summarize all these things is actually a very big challenge. But nevertheless, I think if you focus on what to write rather than writing everything, um, it actually helps to uh, pull the focus of your uh, reviewer to your essay. And you know you need to highlight your points. So first of all, you need to uh, highlight what your visions are as, as, as scientists and educators, you know, uh, and also what are your most important achievements in terms of outreach, research grants, publications, especially in Q1 and Q2, patents, contributions to the nation. And now with the pandemic, right, um, how have you contributed to teaching? You know, do you have any creative approaches? Um, how about the important awards and honors, invited and keynote speakers? Um, don't list all because it's very easy to say that, you know, we are invited speakers for all the university level uh, events, but they don't matter. You need to focus on the prestigious ones because you only have 500 words to highlight yourself, okay? And notable membership, especially in international organizations. Okay, so for organizations such as Global Young Academy, you know, these organizations, um, it's not just taking in anyone who apply, but rather you need to be vetted, your CVs need to be vetted in order for you to qualify to be uh, a member. So when you have such memberships, do highlight them, okay? Impact of your research, they can come in so many forms. For my kind of research, it takes ages for you to finally see the product in the market because it's part of drug discovery, right? And my kind of work holds the basis of precision medicine. So 
impact of research is up to you to interpret, but it's not so much on the numbers of Q1 and Q2 that you pick, but rather what your research can actually bring to the table to uh, improve uh, the problems that exist in Malaysia or how you can actually help society or industry, right? In the long run, how do you actually envision to achieve that, okay? What are your priorities when it comes to student teaching, training, and research? For me, quality always matters. It always matters over quantity. Like, you know, I, I don't know if anywhere else has this uh, graduate on time policies. For me, I would never compromise that. I would want quality rather than to actually hurry my students through so that my students can graduate on time. So that is for me, for me, that's personally, um, what I am as a researcher, as a scientist, as an educator, as well as a supervisor. Okay, what are your aspirations beyond the lab? Um, what are you passionate about? Are you passionate about something enough to want to make a difference? You know, what drives you? For me, it was the experience working at the cancer hospital and the um, dealing with the cancer patients and those at the terminal stage, you know that actually did it for me. You know, they were always on my mind. They were my motivations to do what I do today. Okay, so you should really harness uh, the inspiration and motivation from your experience as an academician and put that um, in your application. Okay, and then they have this Bhutia Jaya Diri where you're supposed to uh, mention your Siswa and your Zamala. So whatever fellowships that you have or scholarships, the prestigious ones, just put in, okay? But please make sure that every piece of the evidence is certified, okay? They would also like to know um, what your pengalaman uh, in leadership is like. So whether you are a, a jury for, or a grant evaluator for, for prestigious grants, you know, I was at that time only an FRGS grant evaluator at university level, but now I'm actually an FRGS grant evaluator at KPT, you know. So these things actually open doors as we actually improve ourselves, we learn, uh, we mature as academicians, right? And, you know, I, I started off as visiting scientists here and there at different universities, and at some point, maybe I hope to be a visiting professor, okay? Um, keahlian dalam jawatan kuasa profesional dan seorang jaya kebangsaan. And then, you know, there, there would be things where I really have nothing <laughs> to fulfill. But it's okay, you know, I, I gave what I could and I gave my best. That's the most important thing. And um, there's this, uh, uh, this section D where you, you have to put in all your anugerah and pengiktirafan, right? So I'm just giving examples, you know, um, as, as young researchers, I'm sure you receive a lot of conference, scholarship, fellowship, travel bursary awards. Just put them in, especially there at the international level. Okay. Um, as I've mentioned previously, membership in prestigious organizations in which one needs to be nominated and selected to be part of. Okay. For example, the Young Scientist Network Academy of Sciences Malaysia at the national level or the Global Young Academy and positions that you hold in these prestigious organizations would just really go to boost your application and show that, hey, you've got leadership skills, you know, not just at the university level, but also at the national as well as international level. Okay, and then the second essay would be focusing on the sumbangan dan impact. Sila perihalkan impact pencapaian berkaitan anugura dan pengiktirafan and it's in Araikan, Dalam Jadwal D. So previously in the, in the Jadwal D, you had to uh, list down all your anugrah and pengiktirafan. So here you have to focus on how you actually use this anugrah, this awards, this pengiktirafan, this uh, uh, honors to actually um, build your vision um, to achieve what you want to achieve. Again, in 500 words. So here, do not list the awards, but mention how the awards have inspired you to move forward in your field or to contribute to society or nation. For me, very much it was me being very meek, and you know, before I went overseas my studies, I was very meek. I, I never dared to speak out, and I've, you know, being overseas and coming back, it really 
um, changed my mindset. I've looked at things very differently. I've become empowered. And for me, these awards are kind of like the platforms for me to voice out as a young scientist. So for me, this is what the awards have given me, the platforms to speak out as a young scientist. Okay, And in, in, in terms of research breakthrough, how do you plan to bring your research to the next level? What is your research direction? You know, it's not the destination, you know, like Prof. Sharizal said, it's actually the journey towards that. They want to see um, what is your vision and how you would want to achieve that destination, okay? And contributions to society, what do these achievements actually mean to you? You, know, you can, for example, um, use this quintuple helix as the basis, you know, because um, most of our research need to be addressing problems or issues, right? So use this to write your essay number two. And I'm sure that they will be able to nail this um, essay when you focus on the quintuple helix. Okay. And in terms of Pernobita, most of us would have publications in scientific journals, right? But I must tell you that it was because of the struggles that the, and the challenges that I had been through. I was so active in writing articles in the mass media, writing articles um, in Patriotish, writing articles in Scientific Malaysian. I remember lobbying and, you know, when I was pregnant, I went to the hospitals and then I would pick up magazines and read these health magazines. I'm like, ah, oh, I need to educate the public on this targeted therapy. So I would actually contact the editor and I said, hey, you know, I'm an academician in uh, University of Science Malaysia. I would like to write an article on targeted therapy. Would you be interested to actually publish my article? So things like that, you know, I did. And of course, you will meet with failures, people who don't respond to you. I mean, you know, being realistic when you're young, right? You don't really have a name or reputation yet. You know, it's easy for some people to just ignore you, but when you're a professor or somebody, it's a different story. So at that time, I was really trying to find my grounds and finding opportunities. At that time, it wasn't about even being popular or being uh, you know out there for people to see, but rather, I know there's this issue where people don't understand and I must get my message out there. I must educate people. And that was the basis why I did all these things. So I started also drawing cartoons and writing layman articles, also to star newspapers, you see, because I experienced a lot of being talked down to. And um, as a young scientist, um, people were not very nice to me, let's just say that, you know. Um, but I realized that actually it's not nice. We should not really be talked down to just because we are lower in um, you know, our titles or maybe we are younger or seniorities and that sort of thing. So there were a lot of things that I was trying to process and I started putting them in words in articles. <laughs> so that's how I got started. And later did I know that when I did all that, just because I wanted to um, put my message out there and I was so passionate about what I do and I want people to understand my work, I realized that along the process, it kind of helped with my personal branding. And it's not because I want to brand myself. I actually, I shut down my social media. I don't like all this big hype, but along the process, I realized that, you know, when you win all these awards, people start looking to you and it's very important that, you know, you now become like a spokesperson. People look up to you as a role model. You, you, no, long, you no longer can afford to just misbehave, you know what I mean? So all this personal branding started to do, uh, to do it right for me. And I realized that because of this personal branding, probably it did help with my AAM application because I supplemented this with um, uh, the, the websites and the, and the articles in, in which I got featured in uh, for AAN, right? And also then there's uh, this part in the G section where you have to just summarize on your project, when you did on your research grants, better still if you have industry or the international grants and your heart and intellect and from commercial and scenario burning on from your yeah, and super, uh, whether you're a supervisor or a co-supervisor. You know, as I've mentioned previously, I, you know, it's not about 
having your eggs in every basket, but it's about what you're really good at and you can be really strong at one thing and you really need to highlight that. For me, I never had any consultation, mainly also because of the kind of work that I work on, on target therapy, precision medicine. We don't really have that sort of R&D in Malaysia and the industry uh, in this field is also not booming and the closest would be in Singapore. But you know, why would Singapore want to come to me, right? They have their own great scientists over there. So don't feel small because you don't have uh, something to put into every section, but be proud that you have something that you're really, really good at that you can actually highlight your achievements, although it may just be in a few sections, okay? And last, I think this is the last, last but not least, is the treatment dan penglibatan dengan community. And this is also where my strength is at and it's also because of part of my struggles and challenges that I've been through that I suddenly found myself, you know, um, working very closely with Amakna uh, National Cancer Council and the uh, Vira Vira Cancer and of course, educating the public. So I guess everything kind of led me to being this um, kind of all-rounder without really blowing my horn, but you know, it's not about me strategizing, but rather it's because of what I want to achieve that everything that I've done to want to achieve what I wanted to uh, achieve. So for Kidmat dan penglibatan dan community, you have to specify if you're a member or leader. So best if you have uh, led a community project, okay? And if you work with NGOs or other organizations, uh, please remember to highlight and specify under the activity, you know, not just list them, but actually specify that, you know, you work with NGOs and you have been a leader in certain activities. And it's also very useful to provide back letter to demonstrate the success of the activity and how the stakeholders have actually benefited from your effort. It's not just having a, a certificate saying that, oh, you've been a committee member in this outreach and that's it, but rather the impact, what have the community benefited from your outreach okay and if you have anything that were, uh, were featured in the newspapers even better supplement them okay um okay so um i think this is one of my last few slides now so i just wanted to um say that every champion was once a contender who refused to give up so if you really believe that you have an idea that works even though it may not be now in in the now time you know, because science is a, it's very fast evolving, you know, if you have a futuristic idea, don't be afraid to work on it. You know, what is most important is for you to work with like-minded people. You know, chances are whatever that we are doing right now, we could always learn from our overseas counterpart because they are very much ahead of us. So we always have something to learn from them and never work on something because you have to. Uh, do it because you want to and do it because you're passionate about it. So what are your motivations and inspirations? Use them to drive you to reach your goal. Okay, and I wanted to also highlight here that science and innovations um, needs the finest scientists regardless of gender. And I'm saying that because I'm actually very full on on gender equality. So when it, and especially um, since the pandemic, I realized that, oh, you know, being a woman, uh, a mother, a woman with career is actually really tough. That was when I actually, you know, appreciate mothers the most because of what I have been through. So for those of you um, who have been struggling because of the pandemic, struggling to hold together your research, your career, you know, trying not to take a back seat and putting everything together, you know, bear in mind that when it becomes an emotional battle and you feel like, you're losing. Remember that a successful woman is one who can build a firm foundation with the bricks that others have thrown at her. You know, we are always strong, but we actually don't know how strong we are until we are given those challenges, you know. And secondly, I would want to um, emphasize that it's important to practice kindness and leadership because kindness is never wasted and it always makes a difference. We rise by lifting others, and especially so now 
during the COVID-19 pandemic, kindness is needed even more because we cannot expect our colleagues and our students, our staff to all put all the problems behind and come to work as if nothing happens. You know, a lot of things have changed. People have lost their jobs. We are lucky that we have not, but we have to then try to um, practice leadership um, so that we can actually bring up the best in our students and in our colleagues, I we underestimate and kindness. All right. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I'll be happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you, Mr. Professor uh, Dr. Uncha In for your passionate uh, sharing and was so motivational uh, to hear you speak. I mean, I think you've shown us that being a square peg in a round hole is no excuse and you can you can fit in if you are an excellent square peg <laughs> so you you determine uh, what happens uh, so um and another thing is that uh, me myself being a uh, a medical doctor who went into research some days i wake up and say why are you so so uh working so hard for it's not like you're trying to cure cancer when there are actually people out there like you doing precision medicine trying to cure cancer so maybe i cannot cure cancer but one of my students can later on so that that gives me hope um, so um, we will open the floor for questions uh, from the from the part participants. But as usual, I want to slip in one one question. One of your slides really uh, resonated with me. The one the five years after PhD is the most crucial. That slide made me want to cry because um, <laughs> I I just got my PhD two years ago, and I think the only thing I did in the past two years, other than surviving the pandemic, is be bogged down by administrative work. Because once you come back from PhD, the whole department is like everybody wants to throw every every administration post to you. So there's a lot of distractions, and I'm already over forty. I'm forty two, so mm -hmm. I would like to know whether or not, uh, uh, Prof, you would like to share with us uh, now that. You, you say that before 40 is the most crucial. Uh, maybe we just want to know what are your plans? I mean, like for uh, the next stage, the after 40, what, what do you envision for yourself? And uh, if you have any advice for us in this, uh, in how to not get distracted with all the things that you have to do and the things that you want to do. So how do you balance that? Right, I, I, I think um, it's, it's never too late, you know, even being 42. And I do know that, you know, as we progress in our career, we will be thrown more and more admin jobs, right? <laughs> so we cannot really run away from that. So the thing is, um, for me, you know, empowerment is one thing. I empower my students. I feel that, you know, if I'm unable to do something because I'm so bogged down with admin job, I used to be able to be in a lab to do research. I used to be able to, you know, just apply to say, hey, I need two, two months off to go to Singapore or any countries to train, you know, to, to, to get results and all that. And it was always easily approved. And then I realized that as the years progress, it becomes harder because you actually have more responsibilities and they won't let you go that easily. So what I, I have observed, you know, when you empower your students or your lab staff, right, you actually encourage them to be independent and they will go the extra mile to support you in your research. So no matter what, I would not want my research to die, right? but I can only do so much as what I can do with my two hands without forgetting my responsibilities um, to the university. You know, I, I'm sitting in, in front of a computer more now, you know, in, in a pandemic, you know, attending these talks and Ali Jawatan Kwasa, this and that. But my students will be the one who will be helping me. You know, they, they'll be the one who will be supporting my research. So if I empower them, so be nice to your students and, you know, always be appreciative. Again, like what Prof Shariza said, it's important to be appreciative because we are in this all together and it's never just a
itu well, it's even harder during this pandemic. It was tied to you have I'm not sure about being a woman and if you have kids, it's even gonna be harder. But you have to always also try to be kind yourself because yeah, sometimes when I thought to myself, oh my goodness, I'm just never good enough. How come I'm such a terrible mother? I can't even take care of my two kids and, and handle my career at the same time. My research, everything is going down. And sometimes you just feel that you have lost control. But it's important to just take that step back and then just talk to myself. It's okay, don't be too harsh on yourself because whatever you're going through, other people are also going through at the same time. Just pace yourself. Thank you, Prof. Uh, uh, is there any other uh, any other questions from the floor? I received one question via the chat box. Um, in the preparation for AAN submission, what do you think was the most helpful contribution by USM in the process? Oh, uh, for me definitely was um, the part when. It was literally two months before they closed the, the application. And obviously, um, USM is pretty good at this. Dr. Asma is very good at this. So like I've mentioned, they have the committee all ready to look into potential applicants already. And then they vet your CV. And then after that, uh, and these people are really uh, those who, who are actually in the panel it, itself, or they have experience sending in the application. So they can actually vet your essays and look at essays if you've actually written it right or you know highlighted yourself enough. So they, they, they gave me that sort of feedback. And then the most, most helpful part was to actually, they work day and night, literally up to night, you know, because we only have one month to put everything, to certify every single evidence, every single piece of evidence and put together, hard bound, uh, everything done on time and then have this hand delivered to Putrajaya. So they have been so helpful. Thank you. I, of course, I, I can imagine how with the with the deadline being so short, I mean, you would need all hands on deck because yeah. Yeah, it's not a personal application. It's the whole university has to back you for it as well, right? Yeah. So uh, I'm glad that you <laughs> managed to do that for you. Uh, are there any, any other questions maybe from our participants that they would like to ask? Yeah, especially the young researchers below 40. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Anyone? Uh, do you have any um, tips on networking? As you said, um, we should try, like for, for those of us who didn't get an opportunity to pursue postgraduate um, studies overseas, mm -hmm. uh, like me again, <laughs> using myself as an example. So do you have any, any tips on networking uh, to get these collaborations going? Yes, yeah, so um, yeah, so that brought me to there was one question earlier for Prof Shariza. Someone talked about imposter syndrome, right? Well, I, I had that all also, you know, although coming back from, from overseas. But the thing is, it's always easy to think that okay, our network is just here because we did our PhDs here. But you know, to actually I call that to be thick face. Actually, I've been so thick face. To be honest, I have this imposter syndrome all the time. I never thought I'm good enough, especially working on a field that is so advanced out there. So sometimes when I'm so desperate, um, you know, I thought that oh, my research is going nowhere. You know, I don't have the right mentors. I don't have the right input. You know, I'm just going around in circles, but there's only so much my brain can do to help me. There's so much reading can do. I need to really work with people who really understand this field. So thick skin or not, sometimes I literally just uh, furnish my CV and just submit, you know, to either the CEO or to some professors overseas and say, hey, I'm working on this and this and this, you know. And, you know, I thought of maybe attaching to your lab to really learn from the best. And then, you know, I'll just turn off my email and, and, and think, okay, you know, why would they reply me, right? <laughs> because who am I, right? <laughs> I mean, they have all the best researchers there. Why would they want to take me in back? You never know when you take chances. So what I'm trying to say is you need to take that chance. Uh, no matter how you think you're not good you are, you are actually good. It's just that you think quite lowly of yourself because you're always comparing yourself to others. 
And no doubt there will always be better people out there. But if you never actually take this step, you're never going to find out how good you can be or what your value is, you know? So just be brave and do it. You know, there'll be people who will respond to you and there'll be people who will not respond to you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, perhaps uh, if there are no other questions from the floor, maybe Associate Professor Dr. Izawati would like to say a few words uh, just as a conclusion to the, the session. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Daya, and thank you to our speaker. Okay, uh, thank you very much to Dr. Hidaya, and thank you uh, also to uh, Dr. Shariza and Dr. Chen. Uh, since that this is um, our second time uh, inviting both of you, we, we are very appreciate. Uh, all your uh, sharings uh, with uh, our academic uh, members and we do hope that we can have uh, more chances uh, to have more uh, uh, sessions like this in the future inshallah okay thank you uh, over to you uh, Dr. Hida. I think, um, yes, we uh, from the first speaker, uh, 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 Dr. Shariza, and also the second speaker, Dr. Ujain, we have learned a lot today, and uh, mostly. Since it's a sharing session, I think both their journeys, even though it's uh, totally different, I mean, the same uh, passion, tenacity, and perseverance, I mean, that theme is there in both, regardless of how different the, the actual journey uh, was. And I hope that uh, all of us today, the young and not so young <laughs> anymore, uh, academicians, uh, we, uh, we can learn from both our speakers today and their journeys. And I hope that it can motivate uh, us to um, refocus, okay? uh, have a new a goal, maybe perhaps that we didn't have before, uh, even though both of them uh, clearly mentioned that our goal should not be for awards, but I think uh, another point of view is we should strive to at least do things that are award worthy. Huh? Whether or not we get awards is a different thing, but we should strive to at least be award worthy in our uh, daily uh, daily lives eh, as educators. And of course, both of them reminded us how important it is to see the students uh, as part of the team, as important team members. In fact, they are the, the reason that we are educators. Eh? Without them, we are just simply people who talk to ourselves. And in my profession, that is not a good thing. Eh? <laughs> that will give you a very bad diagnosis. Okay. So uh, with all of that in mind, once again, I would like to thank both our speakers uh, for sharing uh, their experience with us and for giving us, I feel, uh, new role models to look up to, eh? uh, not only them, uh, Prof. Shariza and uh, Dr. Ong Chir In, but also to, to look at ourselves as role models, eh? the better us, the better version of us. Eh? So uh, it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. So thank you for sharing the journey with us today. Uh, and from on behalf of uh, CPT, I would like to apologize uh, if there are any shortcomings. Uh, as usual, with our online sessions, there's always internet problem and connection problems and whatever <laughs> other problems. Uh, so I hope that the session has been beneficial to everybody and uh, we seem to finish earlier than expected which is a bonus so everybody can go for lunch early uh, and it's not the duration that counts but the actual content eh? so we keep that in mind and uh, we hope to see all of you again uh, in our next session uh, which is coming soon Huh? There's two sessions. So, uh, inshallah, thank you again and uh, 
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and uh, good afternoon to everybody uh, and we close the session with uh, Tasbiki Farah and Surah Walas. Uh, I think we took the picture already, uh, Prof. Izawati, do we need to take another picture? <laughs> Would you like another picture taking session? Oh, and yes. please. Are you ready? Yes, please. Oh, yes. Yes, please do. Uh, for... Yeah, maybe uh, yeah. because we have Dr. the Un with us. Okay, so we can see. Yeah. So again, I think probably I am the. Am I the camera person again this time? <laughs> I can take. I can take the, uh, the photos. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to encourage everyone, more people, to switch on <laughs> their this time. So, if possible, show your smiling, enthusiastic educator faces. Okay. So, are we counting? Okay. One, two, three. Okay. okay. That's it? Okay. Settled. So, thanks again, everyone. Uh, and see you soon, inshallah. Go teach someone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.